The season's highlights of the Detroit Lions are brought to you by United, the airline, the pros fly. Fly the friendly skies of United. Numerous changes left the Detroit Lions with a totally new look for 68. And coach Joe Schmidt was optimistic because the ingredients that make a winner were there. Some of the ingredients were the new faces acquired by trade. From the Rams came quarterback Bill Munson, whose experience, poise, and talent acted as a catalyst, molding the various new elements into a single unit. From St. Louis came Billy Gambrell, who, as an experienced receiver, was the perfect complement to Munson's passes. Billy's sure hands and elusive quality made him a serious threat at any range. An ingredient that bolstered the Lions' defensive unit was number 84, Joe Robb, also acquired from St. Louis. At six foot three, 245, he showed surprising speed and agility to go with his great strength. From Pittsburgh came six foot six, 270 pound John Baker, a new face on the Lions squad that was seen frequently by opposing quarterbacks who were often intimidated into hurrying their throws. This mistake was compounded when cornerback Dick LeBeau was around to grab the misdirected missiles. But with John Baker rushing in, a hurried pass was often better than none at all. Some of the Lions' new faces were those of the young rookies. USC's Earl McCullough soon made his presence felt as a receiver, where his blazing speed became many a safety man's nightmare. Rookie tight end Charlie Sanders came from Minnesota and brought a rugged blue-fingered style that enabled him to hold on to any ball thrown near him despite heavy traffic. A little wiser after a year of seasoning were the faces of Super Sauce. Mel Farr, 1967's Offensive Rookie of the Year, started the 68 season in high gear. And unbelievable as it seemed, he was better than ever. Cornerback Lem Barney, who as 67's Defensive Rookie of the Year had 10 interceptions, made the going miserable for opposing runners. And again in 68, when receivers looked over their shoulders, it seemed that Barney was always there. In his second year as a starter, Jerry Rush was living up to his name. His speed and aggressiveness made him a definite asset to the Lions' front four. Sophomore linebacker Paul Newmoth was a great satisfaction to Coach Schmidt as he bolstered the left side of the defense while visibly improving with each game. Despite all the new and improving faces on the Lions squad, there was still one ingredient every team needs to be a winner. That ingredient is the old faces, the vets, not old in years, but old in experience. Lions had Alex Karras, who in his 10th season was still playing with a combination of strength, speed, cunning, and ferocity that has made him a four-time All-Pro selection. 
Like the proverbial good wine, Alex seems to improve with age. Middle linebacker Mike Lucci, number 53, was having another fine year at that all-important position, and Coach Schmidt was well pleased by his successor at that spot. Wayne Walker, an 11-year Detroit veteran, was a performer of double value. He kicked field goals during the second half of the season on offense, scoring 24 points. And he was named most outstanding defensive player by his teammates. Because of a preseason injury to Bill Munson, rookie quarterback Greg Landry started in the opening game at Dallas. And he started fast by hitting Mel Farr for 45 yards and a touchdown. It was nothing short of sensational when later in the game, he passed to Earl McCullough, who, with the catch, began his sprint toward the end zone and Rookie of the Year honors. But unfortunately, in getting his feet wet, Landry also suffered his baptism of fire. It was an hour of painful learning because he learned on the field and not from the bench, as do most rookie quarterbacks. Although the results of the lesson were a lopsided Detroit loss, the game was invaluable in view of the experience and knowledge gained by the Lions as a team. Many of them were playing together for the first time. Even in defeat, they were obviously a team with all the ingredients. However, they were in need of something to blend these ingredients into a smoothly functioning unit. There was no question about it. The Lions would be back. And sooner than expected, Bill Munson's return provided that needed something. Against Chicago, the Lions did a complete about-face with military precision. They so outplayed the Bears in every phase of the game that it was difficult to decide which was the best team on the field, the Lions' defensive unit or the Lions' offensive unit. defense intercepted eight passes the same number of interceptions thrown during the entire year by Munson who was the lowest in the league in that category the offense was not to be outdone and behind excellent protection Munson was able to riddle the Bears secondary time and again with long passes Linebacker Bill Swain decided he'd rather do it all himself as he intercepted a pass and ran it back 50 yards for the score. Munson's 320 yards passing was the major share of the Lions' total offense of 468 yards. He threw twice to McCullough for touchdowns while completing 15 of 23 passes. To stop the Lions, Chicago needed someone like Mike Wieger, who as Bowling Green's first All-American, was in his first year as a pro starter. Mike had three interceptions for the day to match the three thefts of his roommate, Lem Barney. And Greg Landry got a measure of revenge as he rolled around right in for the final score. No matter where you read it, the score told of the Lions' largest margin ever over a Bear football team. Stock in the team's morale had jumped 42 points when they met the then world champion Packers. They started off right where they had stopped against the Bears. When Starr put the ball in the air, it was like putting it on a plane bound for Miami. 
with either Barney or LeBeau, willing to play the role of hijacker. Bill Munson hit Billy Gambrell with a bullet for an early touchdown. And with the offensive line giving him enough time to pick his targets, Munson hit on 15 of 22 passes for 194 yards. Mel Farr was up to par as he fought his way for a total of 92 yards and a touchdown. But the Packers came back and in the fourth quarter with a score tied at 17, Coach Schmidt called upon his Lions to prove that the Bear game was no fluke. The Lions roared their answer as they repeatedly poured in to crush the Green Bay attack. Detroit's runners, led by Farr and Dave Copay, drove to the Packer 12-yard line as the two-minute warning sounded. Disdaining a field goal attempt on a third and eight situation, but carefully remaining in line with the goal post, Munson lofted a pass toward the end zone. Billy Gambrell, who had beaten his man, was there to make the catch. And the Lions had beaten the Packers 23 to 17 to make their record two wins and one loss. <laughs> Morrell was at a peak as Detroit prepared to meet the Bears for the second time. They were proud of the fact that from a diversified group of individuals, they had molded themselves into a single interacting unit. Each man on the offense had a hand in the efficient and impressive scoring, rushing and passing statistics. Each man on the defensive unit was equally as proud of the fact that the longest run from scrimmage against them was 18 yards, a figure which stood until the next to last game of the season. The Lions had a good thing going and they were enjoying it. Like 15 of the 16 National Football League teams, they also enjoy flying the friendly skies of United Airlines. The Lions opened their second game against the Bears with rookie Jerry DePoister's squib kick, solely designed to keep the ball away from Gale Sayers. But Sayers was to be no problem on this day, as Wayne Walker continually stopped him when he tried to run outside. The Lions held Sayers to a mere 38 yards rushing. In contrast to Sayers, marvelous Mel Farr was having his greatest day of the season as he caught six passes for 73 yards and scored three touchdowns. Running through cavernous holes blasted open by the left side of the offensive line, comprised of Roger Scholes, Chuck Walton, and Charlie Sanders, Farr gained 138 yards on 18 carries. Equally huge holes on the right side were provided by Ed Flanagan, Bob Kowalkowski, and Charlie Bradshaw. It seemed that Mel could smell the goal line. And if he was anywhere near it, he was determined to cross it. Mike Weger provided some defensive artistry that often snuffed out the Chicago offensive attack. Munson and McCullough, with their timing tuned to perfection, had arrived as a formidable combination. When speed and finesse were not the answers, Tom Nowatzki and Farr took it in the hard way. Farr's final touchdown gave him seven in five games and gave the Lions a 28 to 10 victory in a sweep of the Bears series for 1968. The second Packer game of the season was the big one. Mel Farr, showing no signs of sophomoreitis, continued to be a devastating runner. And Bill Munson, with a completion mark of 66%, was showing no sign of resting on his laurels 
as he hit a flying Earl McCullough for the touchdown. Parr's 145 yards rushing kept the Packer defense off balance, and Munson again went to McCullough, who was the loneliest man in the world. The score gave the Lions a 14-14 tie, made them king of the forest in the Central Division. With Munson the leading quarterback in the league, and Farr the leading rusher, the Lions looked as if they were on top to stay. But then disaster struck. On this play against San Francisco, Mel Farr injured his leg and was virtually finished for the season. The offense was no longer able to establish a strong running attack, and they plunged into a six-game streak of ineffectiveness. The passing suffered as teams keyed on Munson, who was playing with little publicized injuries a good deal of the time. And the Lions found that while there are ingredients that make a winner, there are also those that make a loser. Besides Farr and Munson, there were injuries to key personnel like Gordy, Hand, Baker, Rob, and Eddie, all much needed performers. Costly mistakes began to creep in as will happen in any profession when confidence is shaken. Mistakes come in many forms and can mean many things to the team. Sometimes it's a fumble that means the game. Sometimes it is a penalty that comes from trying too hard. And frequently, the price you pay for these transgressions is great. At other times, it is the elements that fight against you. But often, it is the borderline play, the play that could have tipped the game either way. It never goes for you. And it goes against you when a foot is out of bounds. Or for some reason, you can't hold on to a ball. Or a man. Borderline plays often have no explanation, but like bad dreams, they come back to haunt you in March or May. And when you recall them, you can only shake your head in wonderment and disgust. But sleepers must finally awake and bad dreams dissipate. Against Atlanta, Bill Triplett brought the Lions running game back to life. And arrested Bill Munson, who had sat out the previous week, once again found himself at home in a well-protected pocket formed by Scholes, Walton, Flanagan, Kowakowski, and Freitas. He hit Sanders on this one and was virtually unstoppable, hitting on 21 of 28 passes, three for touchdowns. The defense, led by number 53, Mike Lucci, and number 70, Dennis Moore, thwarted the Atlanta ground game. Munson to Gambrell kept the Lions scoring through the airways. And the Lions defense clipped the Falcons' wings on interceptions like Tommy Vaughn's. Gambrell kept his best day as a pro with his third touchdown catch giving him seven for the season, and giving the Lions a 24-7 victory. Once again, all the ingredients had gelled. Cornerback Lem Barney is a man used to waiting. He waits at his position, 
a lion stalking its prey. Like a man in heavy surf, he waits for the huge, crushing wave of linemen. He waits for his chance, and when it comes, he is there. in a world of fluid grace and flowing motion. His elusive moves, agility, and speed speak of something special, for Lem Barney is an all-pro. Sometimes, the seconds seem frozen into minutes, and Lem Barney is alone, waiting before a crowd of 50,000 people who, in turn, are waiting for him to make it all happen. And when ball meets man, he does. The waiting is over, and in long, flashing strides, he is gone. A trail of defenders straggling in his wake for Lem Barney is an all-pro. Thoughts of Barney will make the off-season a little less painful for Coach Schmidt, as will thoughts of this year's rookie performers. Earl McCullough at 40 catches for 680 yards, and after a year of seasoning, should have the moves to go along with his blazing speed. Charlie Sanders, the only rookie to play in the Pro Bowl, also had 40 catches, 10 in the last game of the season. He is sure-handed and rugged, and whispering voices can be heard around the league, speaking of another John Mackey. But these men are by no means the only bright spots in Coach Schmidt's future. Bill Munson, has had a year to learn the Detroit system and has proven that if poise and guts is what it takes, then he's home free. He's also had a year to learn the moves and styles of his receivers. And if Billy Gambrell is any example, there could be more embarrassing moments in store for next year's opponents. <music> to help set up a successful passing game, Coach Schmidt can look forward to a healthy Mel Farr, whose double duty as runner and receiver will keep the defenses more than a little confused. A big question in Detroit has been, can Nick Eddy's knees hold up? If the end of the past season is any indication, the answer is an unqualified yes. All the right ingredients are there for 1969, and after this year, they are well-seasoned ingredients. The Lions may have slipped in 68, but like Bobby Thompson did on this run, they'll bounce back and will be heading straight for the top. And when the winds are howling down winter skies, 
There will once again be smiles on the faces of the Detroit Lions fans because they know that the season of seasoning is over and the Lions look fine for 69.